which one of us is crazy though? Me, a mass murdering guy is in prison for so long. Or you, who goes to work at nine to five, like the like a mark. It's like, uh, look, I, like you'd be making a good point about me, but yeah. in that scenario, it's definitely you. Welcome to the final act of 90s action here on 4Play. This week, we'll be discussing Con Air and probably having a fierce debate as to whether this was better or not than Face Off. It is hilarious in similar ways, as I'm sure you guys have found from watching the film this week. But first off, we do have to talk about our next arc in 4Play, which is we're just going to lean into it. It's December. We're going to do Christmas movies. And we have chosen four. It's not Die Hard. Yes, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. But I think that conversation has more or less been settled at this point in time. So we're going to take a grab bag from cinema history. And we're going to do some crossover a little bit with 90s action movies uh, up first. Because that will be Batman Returns, which is another 90s action movie. So now you get the hybrid to kick things off. We will then do Scrooged. The night, what is it, 1988 Bill Murray uh, yep. comedy based off of Dickens' A Christmas Carol? We will then time travel back to the 40s for It's a Wonderful Life, one of the all time great Christmas films. And then we're going to end shockingly with an anime film by Satoshi Khan called Tokyo Godfathers. Uh, you guys probably didn't see that twist coming, so we'll do an Asian Christmas movie. Satoshi Khan is one of my favorite anime directors. He's way, way up there with me. You guys might have seen, like, Perfect Blue or Millennium Actress or um, Paprika, some of his other films. So Tokyo Godfathers, excellent movie and very much worth watching, even if you're not an anime fan, because none of us are, and we actually like that movie. So there you go. Any thoughts on our Christmas theme and the movies we picked? I think we've been quite fair on this one, because here's the thing. I actually do think the genre we're doing now is the most easy one to play to the crowd. Like, if you either haven't seen these films, they're all, like, fun films, the one, the 90s one, the actions ones we're doing, or a lot of them are really famous. Like, I think the movie's like Mission Impossible, very famous, obviously. I actually think this is one where, in the Christmas spirit, we're not going as hardcore as we could have doing the most obscure possible Christmas movies. We've sort of picked a couple that slightly lean into it, and then a couple, obviously, like, stuff like It's a Wonderful Life, essentially, is, like, full-on Christmas in every sense, isn't it? So I think we've got to like a good smorgasbord of, of films for this one. And I also do get the sense, by the way, I think a lot of Zoomers won't have seen it. It's a, it's a wonderful life and maybe would never get around to watching it. Maybe for them, they don't watch black and white movies, for example. Like I think it's actually an example of one where like almost as homework, you'll be glad we made you watch it. Yeah, I think um, qu like quintessential Christmas movies, there's what, you know, you can't ever break the rule, which is they sort of have to have a feel good factor to them right and so no matter how dark it gets and you know in a couple of these movies uh pretty fucking three of them actually pretty fucking dark <laughs> yeah. uh, pretty fucking dark but there has to be that redemptive element or a feel good element or something that taps into that love your fellow man spirit of the season and so if you take that to be the core of the Christmas movie, you can really go into any genre. And I think this is a good cross-section that proves that point. Uh, because, you know, we've got anime in there. We've got, you know, what I would consider sort of classic Hollywood in there. We've got, you know, this sort of eclectic 80s, 90s comedy in there. You know, and, and, and so, but, they're, but they all carry a sort of similar message, uh, which is, you know, Love your fellow man at Christmas and then the other 11 months of the year be a piece of shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, we sort of pulled it out of our ass. Just, you know, full disclosure, everyone watching, because we were like, we've got all these other like wicked ones we want to do. But we thought, you know what? We sort of dropped the ball on Halloween where we didn't do a horror movie <laughs> for some. So let's do it proper for Christmas. And then we chose Batman Returns. So... <laughs> Listen, it works. People will see for themselves. So. It does. It does work, but it is. This is not the normal. I think Christmas list. I think as a starting point, it's look, fucking absurd. Scrooge, Scrooge, you know. Scrooge, and the, it's a wonderful life. 
you know, I could I could get yeah. those. Batman Returns and Tokyo Godfathers, we definitely got a bit weirder with that one. But we do like to have a mix. We do like to have a mix. Thing is, though, on the Batman one, I will say, I also think that's actually like a gift we're giving to younger fans who maybe are like teenagers or young adults, etc. Because here's the thing. I actually get the sense that a lot of them have heard the like the 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 vibe that like those Batman movies were a joke, but they don't know that's like three and four. Like those are the ones that yeah. they jump the shot. The Tim Burton terrible. ones are so, good. But I think people actually naively lump them all together though. Because I it's one yeah. of the things that used to piss me off, which you'll know this reference. When when The Dark Knight came out and everyone was going, finally, serious movie of Batman. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like we are, yeah. look, this is good, but we already Jack did do was this great. Just, yeah. <laughs> like mate, when people said that as well, when they were like, look, obviously Heath Ledger was really good. If you think Jack Nicholson was bad as the Joker, like what you watch your movies for, mate? Like that's that's mega. It's just obviously a more comic book esque style, isn't it? So no, I actually do think if you've never watched those movies, first of all, Batman Returns is the best of them, and it's just a really good movie. It's not even just a good comic book; it's just a good fucking movie, mate. I think that's one of the things people don't really understand about superhero movies and why we get so many of them now. And much like the comics themselves, the hero archetype is updated for the times that it reflects and certain heroes will emerge as more popular at certain periods of history. You know, you think about sort of Reagan era um, coming out of that with the Punisher suddenly is the hot shit. You know, I, I grew up, Punisher was one of my favorites as a kid, but he's like a really dark hero with a really dark arc. He's a veteran of PTSD whose family's been gunned down and he's really fucking tough on crime, which is a conservative's wet fucking dream. And so, you know, the, the, the heroes are reflective of the time that they're in and the reboot of Batman for its time you know I mean it was day and night to the Adam West era stuff right it was fucking it was dark for its time it was broad for its time I thought Michael Keaton has sort of gone down canonically as a really underrated Batman it was sort of I love Michael him. Keaton I yeah, love Michael for Keaton. real the only <laughs> there's a couple of bits where I'm not really like and it's not his fault or Keaton's fault it's like this, it, Tim Burton you know, they just didn't know who Batman was. They didn't know who his code was. And, you know, the, 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 they, they sort of make him do and say things that aren't kind of in line with the character, you know. But overall, I think he's great. I think he does a wonderful example of sort of exploring that um, in, in kind of like almost fourth wall breaking with Birdman, which I think is a wicked movie people haven't seen as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, look. The, the, those Batman updates are legit, and I actually think when we get around to watching them, I haven't seen Batman Returns since I saw it as a kid. Oh, sure. In, in the cinema. Oh, that's I'm, the other I'm, thing I'm going to be very do. intrigued to see how We're also going to do that in general, which is every now and then on genres, we will just, like, fuck with you and just use, like, rules lawyering. Like, for example, as a troll, mm. I think at some point when we do superhero movies, we should put Birdman in, obviously, because the joke is, again, it's yeah. just in the most loose possible context of superhero movie. But you can get away with it. It's a way to make you watch it. We'll, we'll I do, I do it, love guys. I do love that that film. I really like that one. Um, yeah, but yeah. yeah. It's, it's really good. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's talk about Con Air. This is up there, as I'm sure you guys have noticed, with ridiculousness on par with Face Off. It somehow mm -hmm. has an absolutely amazing cast, especially for the time, people who were uh, kind of up and coming, because we can just go through this. Like, it, it ended up just becoming kind of a who's who of late 90s, mid 90s, yeah. early 2000s cinema. Nicolas Cage, John Cusack, John Malkovich, Steve Buscemi, Ving Rames, Cole Meany. Um, Dave Chappelle is randomly in this movie, Danny Trejo. And a lot of the purpose of this film appears to be getting most of these people with their shirts off and all sweaty. So they just got all oh, yeah. the most muscular guys uh, to have real or fake tattoos. I actually have no idea. Take off their shirts. Danny and Trejo's then just like, <laughs> Oh, yes, Danny Trejo's a real for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, but like, so here, here, here's, here's the first point as to why this is an anomaly and what makes it an interesting film. Action movies are not ensemble films by, by necessity, because what do we need structurally in an action hero movie? We need an action hero who is, you know, the protagonist who is a, a Superman in some way. So they have an exceptional set of skills and, you know, or they're, or they're just really resilient. They're really tough, you know, whatever it is. Uh, and they have to have a villain 
that is in some way uh, a, a good foil for them, an equivalent threat, maybe by being stronger in an aspect they're weak in, which is a traditional trope, or maybe just being a mirror image of them, just with a very different morality, like Face Off, for instance. So, but, th but then what else do you have? You get a sidekick, maybe, a love interest, and then everyone else is fucking fodder. Because they're not necessary to tell the story. The story of an action of an action hero movie is the action hero faces untold danger and somehow overcomes it and wins the day, wins the love interest, saves the sidekick, whatever it is, saves the kid, you know, whatever it is. You don't need a big cast to tell that story. What makes fucking Con Air amazing is... Nick Cage, really? And we'll talk about it later, no doubt. It could just be generic white vest, man. It doesn't matter. The ensemble cast is what elevates this because everybody is doing something. Everybody is interesting in their own way. It's very video games and how they're all introduced where it's like, and that guy there is Billy Bedlam. <laughs> killed his fucking wife. And they've, all got, they've all got nicknames I do love and that shit. Part. That's William Bedford, a.k.a. Billy Bedlam. Mass murderer? The same. He caught his wife in bed with another man, left her alone, drove four towns over to his wife's family's house. Killed her parents, her brothers, her sisters, even her dog. <laughs> yeah, but that's what I mean. But it's like, this is what I mean. So what, what I'm going to say right at the start, before we sort of get into it, is I totally vibed with this movie more than Face Off. And, oh, my. And, and the re <laughs> Face Off for me, right, there is there is a level of cheese and stupidity I am I can work with. And Face Off goes off the cliff for me to a point where it's detrimental to the movie. Con Air gets right up to it and then screeches, does a fucking wheelie and goes, and I go, okay, this is fine. <laughs> this is fine. So, so for 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 me, what what actually makes this movie work is this incredible ensemble cast, many of whom uh, do uh, have much more memorable scenes than Nick Cage. Malkovich chewing the fucking scenery, <laughs> you, you, like Ving Rams as a fucking militant militant anti-white like black, black Panther. supremacist, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> bro, like like fucking Steve Buscemi. As a fucking just like a dude who like just murked forty people and then proudly proclaims, "I rode round three states with a child's head as a hat," and you're like, "What is happening here?" Danny Trejo, a serial rapist called Johnny Twenty Three, because that's each one of his victims, and he gets a like this is mental, guys. Like, so I, I like I I totally forgot an aspect to this film, um, but I have to say, for me. What makes it superior to a face-off to some of the other stuff like The Rock or whatever? It's this fantastic ensemble cast that are just all hamming it up for your entertainment. And and they deserve a round of applause because everybody swings for the fences on this motherfucker. It's great. By the way, Except I actually I'm I'm with Richard on this one. Even though I actually I disagree in the sense I did like face off quite a lot. Obviously, like we had our own battle on that one. I do think this movie is actually Here's the thing. Obviously, Total Recall is a much better film, but I actually think this is really enjoyable viewing experience. Like, I said, I said this to Monty. Like, when I watched this film, I essentially had, like, a smile on my face the whole fucking way through. It's just a really great... And I think you nailed it there, Richard. This movie inherently... Like, face off, like I said, I think, actually, John Woo didn't intend it to be cheesy, and I don't think Nick Cage, actually, himself thinks I'm playing, like, sort of a ridiculous... I think it's... Again, I think they all think they're doing, like, Oscar-winning work, right? The difference is, in this film, I actually get the vibe that like they totally understand this is Hollywood cheese it's I say so you say though the actual like the flavor of it is it's spot on though this is it's almost perfect the like tone of the cheese well I agree with you they go very ridiculous like the certain things are looted like obviously some of the scenes in this like spoiler Monty I don't give a f you can't tell me the helicopter scene at the end of Mission Impossible is like unacceptable and then be fine with the like with the landing on the fucking like <laughs> Vegas not, strip you know what I, I mean not. like that's why I'm saying you know, all I'm saying is let's just keep it standing boys so that's already <laughs> ridiculous but Everything before that, like it's like you say, Richard, they do just go like this. It's almost like it gets to the point where you're like, you're almost going too far. Okay, you didn't, so I'll forgive that. You know what? I'll yes. let that, I'm, oh I'm enjoying my. it enough to let that go. Because I do think this movie's really fucking fun. It's really fun. Literally, there are so many memes that come from this that, again, like they have to be intentional. And I'll tell people a piece of information that will explain to you how I enjoy this movie without claiming it's a great film or piece of cinema. So here's a piece of trivia for you that is mental. You're going to think I'm trolling when I say this. The guy who directed this movie 
had never directed any Hollywood films, but he literally directed the music video for Rick Astley, Never Gonna Give You Up, <laughs> the, the fucking Rick Roll song. He did that video, the one where he's spinning around. <laughs> we're in love. And here's why I bring that up, Richard. This is true. I've told you this on By The Numbers before. Because you know when everyone started that meme of doing that Rick Roll and going like, oh, yeah. this song sucks. I famously, because I was born in the 80s, I love that song. And every time I would even get Rick Rolled, I was like, what are you talking about? This is the shit. Play it again, Rick. And I'll be living that shit. So in the same vein, I wouldn't claim that's great music, Monty, or amazing writing or great performance. It is but I tell you what, I, fuck, I fucking love that song. And I love Con Air too. It's fucking great, yeah. mate. All right, all right. So, so, I'll just say it on the side as well. Here's the thing. I did watch this movie high, but one, I'm a trained professional. Don't try this at home, kids. And two, if there was ever a movie I knew was going to knock it out of the park, this one was right on the list. Yeah. So I actually yeah. did that as a gift to myself on this one. Normally I watch Stone Sober and take all the notes. I was loving this movie. It's fucking shit, so, boys. Yeah, I, so I gave I, up on the notes after a page, dude. I was like, you know I, what, fuck this. Richard, I agree with you that the strongest part of this is just definitely the casting and the actors having yep. fun with their characters. And had this had a bad cast this movie would be absolutely unbearable oh, but the problem oh, sure, the, the, sure. the, the problem the problem is that this movie is just so badly written and i know we like uh, you know good fast pacing on this show the pacing of this movie is too fast a lot of the time and they just constantly drag more unnecessary garbage into scenes and then make it go at basically warp speed throughout this they don't they never leave any time for anything to be explained or to breathe it is simply like i'll talk about it in a bit but let's let's discuss what this movie is first because the premise is equally ridiculous to to, I believe the term out. is high concept, Christopher. <laughs> oh, okay. So, right. first off, they have to figure out uh, uh, the the primary problem with this movie that this movie has is how to get a likable character into prison. <laughs> so, of course, it starts out <laughs> yeah. with Mister Golden Boy Army Ranger Nicholas Cage, aka mm -hmm. Cameron Poe, in Mobile, mm -hmm. Alabama, in the in the heart of America, and Nicolas Cage does a terrible Alabama accent throughout this entire yes. movie. Just really... I love, I love how shit the accent is. That's another yeah. thing that actually is a charm yeah. to it. Because again, <laughs> that just shows what I told you, Monty. Nicolas Cage doesn't know he's doing this. He actually thinks like, like fucking the classic example of fucking Leonardo DiCaprio Blood Diamond. He thinks he's nailing that accent. He thinks like, I'm sort of like a method actor. I can do anything to me. Even though I agree, Monty. It's so like you when you're watching it, there's times where I'm thinking, like, bro, they can do unlimited takes and they're going with this one. Like, it's actually insane how bad his accent is, but it has a charm to it, like it's, I say. Because combo... that's the other thing I'm just in when I hear that accent. I'm like, this is so dog shit. I mean, let's go, let's go. When, God damn when, it, you bastard. I mean, like, it's like a posse. When he just says, You should have put the bunny in the box. I, I was like, No, no. Yes. <laughs> I said, put the bunny. Back in the box. He should have. <laughs> <laughs> he should anyway, have. Anyway, obviously, he starts with this military oh. guy. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, he's yeah. he's an army ranger, and he's 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 desperately in love with his Alabama wife, and she is newly pregnant, and they are out at a bar celebrating. Yeah. Uh, while yeah. she's pregnant. The, the, she's the, working. The, she's the, working. Oh, she's working. Okay, she's working. It's possible. Yeah. <laughs> it's set up. It's all there for you. There you so, go. So, so everyone's what, buzz on the eve of her <laughs> so, so what I love about this scene is he like he like puts his he like puts his ear to her belly, even though she like is not visibly pregnant at all, and they apparently know it's no. a girl already, which wouldn't be possible. So they allude to the fact that it's a girl, and says he says that he's going to be very proud of his daughter if she grows up to be Miss Alabama. <laughs> You're going to be Miss Alabama? Well, that makes your daddy very proud. Why not? So oh, we've no, already Alabama, we've yeah. already reached oh, so like. Good. Peak Americana there's a, there's a, right here. Women in Alabama money. It's in oh, the way, you, you've mentioned it there, but that one ironically is a real reason why I actually also do this movie. This movie is what people who now like are politically like disaffected oh. would unironically say if they could go back in time to this America, this is where they would go. Like this is like the prime like America of like before oh, yeah, we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll get to that. Uh, yeah, we'll know. get to that. All right. All right. So so anyway, uh of course there are some 
uh, ne'er do wells at the bar in Alabama. I know that's very surprising. Is one of them? Is one of them Wayne Grohl? Is the guy he kills Wayne Grohl yeah. from Heat? Is he though? Is he? I don't know. I, don't I, think I, thought, so. I thought he he did look like him. But I, I, let me just look it up. Sorry, do right. continue. I, I so didn't so basically, the these guys are trying to harass him because they want to get with his wife, and they leave the bar, and then they attack him in the rain, and he nobly defends himself against three of them. It Accidentally, is. it is amazing. That's actually amazing. Uh, yeah. it, 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 and he ends up accidentally killing one. Cut immediately, by the way, to a court scene because remember this movie moves at warp speed, so we've got to establish. Yes. As fast as possible, that Nicolas Cage is an Army Ranger All-American hero, that his wife is pregnant, and that he has been unjustly attacked and then switched to the court scene where he's put in prison for seven to ten years for no reason, even though they agree that he was the one who was attacked because he's an Army Ranger and therefore has lethal skills as if being in a one versus three, protecting your wife would lead to a 10 year sentence. When they do the meme thing that famously people used to say before the internet, like my uncle has done karate yeah, to a black yeah. belt and his hands are registered. With your military skills, you are a deadly weapon and are not subject to the same laws as other people that are provoked because you can respond with deadly force. They actually, that's a real part of the plot. Yeah. That This is no. also why I say, Monty, this is why you can't not like this movie, because how could you even get past these opening scenes if you don't like it? You'd have to well, take I, I want to say it as well. For, penny, for a pound, that's what I was saying. Well, I want to say as well, probably the worst lawyer in any fucking movie ever. So let's just have a look at the situation. My yeah. pregnant wife is being harassed by three rowdy drunk guys at the bar she works at. I'm, an, I'm a decorated veteran coming home <laughs> right the three guys jump me with a knife in a car park while i'm with my pregnant wife and while we're throwing hands i give one the old wapa and fucking accidentally kill them i'm not doing a day of time of course i'm not, not doing a day of time like the cops even just gonna go i just want them things i wouldn't even worry about it buddy thanks for your fucking service especially in america and of this course. lawyer like, especially this in alabama them. by the way <laughs> I know, right? I know. What the fuck? And like the lawyer said, maybe I should probably plead guilty on this. You know, you get four years, you'll be out in one. Like, don't you? Haven't you floated this strategy with the prosecution or anything? Like, <laughs> do you know the judge? None of that. And the judge just goes, "Well, I think you're a piece of shit, sir. You soldiers coming yeah. home, chilling our yeah. civilians, seven to ten years. And by the way, no." Where's the appeal? Instant appeal. You filed the appeal that day. What the fuck? I'm telling you, you wouldn't do a day. You wouldn't have oh, Of course not. Me, you wouldn't so, do a day. So that's the, this is one of the reasons why. But, I mean, by the way, what's even the alternative? Even if he is a registered deadly weapon, what? Do you just let him kill him? Like, what's yeah, the right. uh, You're right. I should have died. I should have gotten stabbed with a switchblade. You're right. You're right. It, it was like, it was like somebody was getting put in jail there, no matter what happened. It's just so ridiculous. So so anyway, uh, again, no explanation for this. Like, there's no appeal. And all this happens in, like, a span of five minutes into this movie because this movie just hauls ass throughout the entire time. All right. So he gets put in prison. We're going to get to more ridiculous shit. He then he then spends the next, what, seven years in, a like, a maximum security prison, which for accidental manslaughter is also ridiculous, but we won't get into that. So he's with, you know, the worst of the worst. All right. It's time. He's going to be out on parole now, guys. Of course, he's never seen his daughter, who's now seven years old. And we find out later, the re I was like, I was talking to my wife, and I was like, why didn't they just visit him in prison? This is stupid. And it's because my later it's explained. was never going to see me surrounded by murderers. <laughs> He that wasn't going to be the first time she That's saw me, not my little hummingbird. The, you have to realize, oh, Monty, he, even though, look, I agree, it's terrible script writing. <laughs> it is just essentially an excuse, though, because I was going to go into this, but you, 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 since you all like, pass a comment as you explain the premise, I'll do it as well, right? So basically, first of all, this might, uh, bear, bear in mind, we had fucking face off in this category. This is probably the most manipulative opening ever to oh, a movie in Hollywood yes. history. Because, like you say, it does two things that are both so absurd on its face, but it has to do it to get the end out that it wants in the story. So one is you have to get a totally innocent man and have him in essentially like
like San Quentin Max security prison, he would know again. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense as to why he wouldn't. So that's why it's that not even a totally innocent thriller. man. It's a literal American hero army ranger. <laughs> <laughs> you have like a ridiculous railroad that makes no sense in it. By the way, his wife's even with him. That's the other thing. He's not even like on his own. Or like the whole thing, like you say, it's the most crazy open shut case. But then even more, you think to yourself this, right? Yeah, but how are we going to maintain this tension while he's on like the Con Air flight? Like what's going to make it unique? Yeah, he's going to get out. By the way, even that, like, yeah, right. You're getting out. We're transferring you out. Let's put him on the plane with all the murderers that have got like <laughs> life in prison. That already in itself is also ludicrous. But you got that. And then the last detail, as you reference, is what's going to keep the tension all? Like at the end of the day, like if they just kill him, it's unfair. Still never met his daughter. And then the idea that if you don't know, spoiler, you've already seen the movie if you're watching this. When they then tie that in later where it's like they sort of find out he's never met his daughter. It's like, what is that? This is so contrived. It's fucking insane. But I will say at the same time, that does make it straight fire. And then the idea oh that at the end, where, just to, I'll skip right to the end. At the end, even though he's just gone through all that insane stuff, so to where his daughter still is like shy, like, who are you though? This is weird, isn't it? <laughs> weird emotional ending to the movie. Like, the whole, I, I agree, the whole contrivances are ridiculous. That is just bad script writing. But like I said, it's they had to find a way to get to point B, Look, you know, so they just did whatever they needed to. Just as an aside, all. I pointed out how Face Off has very few actual plot holes for being fucking ridiculous. There's nothing but plot holes in this movie. There's well, nothing. It, it doesn't yeah. even play. At least Face Off plays by its own rules. This is just garbage writing. Okay. So anyway, he gets out of, he's going to go to home on parole and as Thor in reference. He's going to be put on a plane to also a multi-stop trip for some reason where he's flying to Carson City, Nevada. You're already the bus. So they're like, oh yeah, this guy, we'll, we'll put all the prisoners on the plane. He's going back to Alabama where he's going to meet his daughter and his, his wife. We've been waiting for him these long seven years. And on the way, we're going to fly to Carson City, Nevada. Okay. Uh, and we're going to do a prisoner transfer there which actually is central to the plot of the movie. So anyway, they load Ving Rhames and John Malkovich onto this plane. They escape, basically the short version is they escape uh, and they take over the plane. They, they make a joke about how it's con air now. They continue with their plan to go to Carson City because they actually have to pick up a drug dealer, uh, like a South or Central American drug dealer. And... They, they then go through this prisoner exchange where they, they put some of the guards and tape them up and pretend they're the prisoners and haul them off. So they pick up this drug dealer and then they continue with the hijacked plane to the middle of nowhere in Nevada to an abandoned airfield where they're supposed to meet up with this drug dealer's like jet and then leave and go to somewhere in Central or South America. I don't remember if they said where or not. Uh, however, that goes wrong. And uh, oh, by the way, in the middle of this, John Cusack is a federal air marshal who is supervising this flight. They tried to put a DEA agent as a plant to get information out of the drug dealer they were picking up. And then the DEA and John Cusack, so Cole Meany, who you might know from Star Trek, he's Chief O'Brien, uh, he and John Cusack fly around and attack helicopters chasing this plane. And then there's a giant firefight at the abandoned airfield once the drug plane explodes because it was a ruse. And then everybody kind of just dies, except they all get back into the plane. Then they fly to Las Vegas where they have to crash, crash land on the strip, which by the way, it's completely ridiculous because McCarran Airport is like literally right in the middle of Las Vegas, but they don't have fuel to get there. Oh. And then they crash land on the strip. And then amazingly, I did find this out this out about this movie. The famous Sands Casino, which is obviously yeah. like the icon of the Rat Pack era. So it was like Frank Sinatra's favorite casino. It was actually demolished and put in the, they put the Venetian where the Sands was. And this movie actually helped demolish that because they ruined the front of they demolished the front of the Sands Casino because it was already going to be destroyed. And then they shot that for the movie, which is incredible. I will give that that is actually incredible. Um, and then, of course, they meet his wife and daughter are for no reason at all in Las Vegas at the end. There's a very awkward scene that is deeply unsatisfying. And Steve Buscemi's serial killer is shown playing uh craps 
and we're supposed to feel good. I don't know. The it's ending's the super weird. Think Norwalk. That, by the way, there's <laughs> another example of how the writing definitely is accidentally good. It's not intent. It's not skillfully <laughs> written because, as you say, they take this character who this is the detail everyone's going to forget because of how Hollywood tricks get you. As Richard says, it's not that the Steve Buscemi character also has been railroaded and is secretly a good guy. Oh, no, no, no. He literally is a serial killer murderer who has even killed and bragged about killing children. But then they somehow managed to later forget that and act like actually like maybe he has a code and he doesn't kill these kids though. <laughs> and then also towards the end, make it like, and in a way, wasn't he the one you wanted to get away with it? It's like, no, 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 definitely not. Like <laughs> no. I want him back. Like I want him back in a maximum <laughs> security right. prison. And like, like the idea that's the happy ending is so crazy to me. I know it's so, so wild in it. So the characters, and as as Richard said, way, just as an aside, it's even mad inappropriate as well when someone's a potential like child murdering rapist type character to go feeling lucky, sir. I know exactly. Dude. <laughs> what do you mean? And he's like, "Tell you what, I'm the, gonna go the fucking end, crazy." End, I know, like, <laughs> which is why the end credits. It's what I love about it. It's they do it like theater. And they all they show all of the characters yes. again, and they're all laughing and they're all happy, and it's like it's just a fucking movie. Yeah, yeah. The, the the ending is mental. Yeah, this child murderer is back on the streets in Vegas, like <laughs> and, and, right. So it's like just to remind you that that that's all. <laughs> it's all fun. They're all laughing. Call me. He trying to look attractive for five seconds. Like looks like a fucking potato with a wig. <laughs> fucking ridiculous. Like, call so, fucking me. So, Heart Rob. Call me. So the, the the characters in this are interesting because obviously John Malkovich is supposed to be this like genius criminal mastermind who's yes. psychotic. And as you mentioned, Danny Trejo is this, you know, serial rapist. Steve Buscemi. <laughs> Steve Buscemi is I, I, this is just another hilarious piece of writing in this movie because he plays Garland Green, who is a, a like mm. a psychotic serial killer. And what was so funny about this is he's not on the plane at first. And I kept wondering to myself, when is Steve know. Buscemi going to yeah. show up in this movie? And in the Carson and City transfer, in the, in the Carson City transfer, yeah. they're like, yeah. they're like, who's this? As they, as they, as they bring up this truck and the truck doors open and the chair slides out. And he's just like, he's like in this like straight jacket with the, with like the, the, the muzzle, the muzzle yes. on him. And they're controlling Bro. him with like two metal poles. And they're like, you know, yeah. sudden change. Now we're putting this serial killer on the flight. I'm like, you wouldn't suddenly change that. That guy requires some very serious handlers. They're like, no, it's it's fine. This guy's just gonna. He's a, you know, we upgraded him to business. Just gonna shove him on the plane with everybody else. <laughs> stupid and also i can say what they actually use that character for like i implied for real is to be sort of like hey have a bit of decorum as an evil criminal guy like his whole shit's to be sitting there like they're fucking wild aren't they like what are you talking about you're a mass murderer that was brought on and you're a skip too like why you why have you been made like the moral center of this film like because that, that part is so clumsily done because as i say all they do is it's like they wreck it's like they delete the part they told you about his history and then just show a bunch of scenes that manipulate you to think he's awesome it's like what are you doing with this movie <laughs> it's super weird the only thing I can think of is, um, you know, because Bashemi obviously isn't usually cast as an absolute monster. But interestingly enough, uh, he did play uh, in 1995's Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead, one of the best films of the 90s. Oh, I don't care. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll ride that one to, to yeah. the end. Uh, love that movie. Um, he plays Mr. Shush, or a a.k.a. Buckwheats who is a hitman so terrifying because of his M.O., which is he he just appears out of nowhere and shoots you in the ass. That's how he kills you. He shoots you in the ass, and you just die from internal bleeding, like uh, from from a wound to the asshole. That's his, like, specialist hit, right? And so, obviously, like, when Mr. Shush comes to get you, it is terrifying, and that was 95. And I just think two years later... Also, the same later, guy like, probably... who, who wrote this movie wrote that movie, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, so probably they're like, you know, who's the scariest motherfucker in? Well, you've already got him. You've got like Malkovich, you've got like Finger Arms, Danny Trejo used to be in like the fucking cartel. No, 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 no. Steve Buscemi's a fucking animal. Have you seen things to do with Denver when you're dead? And they just bring him out. And, 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 and funnily enough, it, it, again, 
like the film is so nuts you just don't question it as it's happening like you know just like yeah it is Pashemi and Electa mask yeah pro- probably uh, whatever like <laughs> yeah, yeah, fine. my comment on this I actually did have a note all I put the note just says why is he Steve we live in a society Pashemi because that is essentially the character he plays isn't it yeah, it's, yeah. Probably, it's the idea that a mass serial killer is going to be like Pretty fucked up world we live in. Like, what are you talking when about? he says, when he says to Nick Cage after fucking Billy Bedlam's having like a tantrum trying to get in a fist fight, and he just goes, "He's a font of misplaced rage." <laughs> <laughs> like, I I really you that. He's a font of misplaced rage. Name your cliche. Mother held him too much or not enough. <laughs> but I, but it is so funny because of the speech he gives about. Am I crazy or are you the one who cr- who's yeah. crazy who goes exactly. to work for yeah. 50 years yeah, exactly. for 50 hours a week I love it. just so you could retire? Yeah. And then immediately afterwards. One store when it's like, I know what you mean, Monty. It's like, like I say, if you were doing a We Live in a Society, that's a good angle. But in that scenario, right, it's like the comedy skit goes like this. Which one of us is crazy though? Me, a mass murdering guy is in prison for so long. Or you who goes to work at nine to five, like the like a mark. It's like, uh, look, I, like, you'd be making a good point about me, but yeah. in that scenario, it's definitely you, you like, this yeah. one I'll, like, that one that's out I agree I'm with my priorities that. but it's still you it is but, still but, but no, I love I, I love the fact that he comes out right afterwards just as a total non sequitur Richard that line you mentioned earlier where he just says one time I drove through three states with a go. girl's wearing a girl's head as a hat one girl I drove through three states wearing her head as a hat it's my daughter's birthday today Please feel free not to share everything with me. And as a hat, as I brought, that, this really isn't helping the whole angle that maybe you're like some misunderstood dude. I know. Now look, while we're still talking about Steve Buscemi, because we we gotta just talk about all the cast, so we gotta we gotta put Buscemi to bed. What is that fucking like? Can anyone explain to me what the thought process there is? When they get to the second airfield and the drug dealer betrays them, um, and he's gonna fly away on a jet and just leave them for the police or whatever. Right. What well, Steve Buscemi wanders off. And keep in mind, this is just in a it's a dust it's a one strip airfield in the middle yeah. of nowhere. It's just in a junkyard for some reason. <laughs> like I don't even know like no one even maintained like what's what? Like aviation <laughs> standards, like for fuck's sake. Anyway, he like just wanders off into the literal desert and you're like, oh Bush, but that that's and it. There's then. a trailer park. out. Yeah, yeah, and then <laughs> The next scene, he's in a trailer park. I, 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 first time I watched this, I thought it must be a hallucination. He's just gangster tripping or whatever, you know. But like, he sat in a fucking dirty pool with no water in it, all rusted out, and a little girl is having a tea party there by herself, no adults around in this abandoned trailer park. Like, I was like, oh, he's he's gangster tripping. He's, but canonically, he can't be gangster tripping because. He's got a doll at the end, so they must have interacted. Unless, there's, unless there's some hidden subtext I've missed, and I don't think this is the movie for subtext. So they just put a little girl in the middle of nowhere. Why? To set up this weird, like fucking peril thing for the child. It's not. It's not only that they put her in the middle of nowhere in in an empty swimming pool with a creepy life size naked doll across from her, and. Yeah. I, I, it makes absolutely no sense. Yeah, and no, it, there's it, not, it, nothing <laughs> about that scene makes any sense. And, and, you know, basically, I think what they were going for was like, oh, shit, yeah, we put that line in because it was too cool to leave out about him wearing a child's head as a hat. So what we need to do <laughs> now is show... He, he's reformed a little bit. He wouldn't <laughs> kill this child. Yes, yes exactly. exactly. So, so they build all yes. this like, creepy music, like ah, like the voice almost like shh, yes. shh, ah, like he's yeah. gonna get the kid. And you think then he's going to see him somewhere, don't you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you're like, it, uh, it, it cuts after more bullshit. <laughs> By the way, after more bullshit, the only yeah, connective well, tissue would describe gosh. each scene in this movie. Yeah. Right, but like then it just so cuts the to the TV. He'll just force you through the movie. It's yeah, just like, yeah, yeah. Hey, Next, next, like you know, like all the all the clips are all smashed. Yeah, and 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 then it's like the kid just comes out like, "Bye, Mister Serial Killer, thanks." And you're like, "What? What? What was that about?" The internal logic. What's that about? We know he has killed children. (laughs) The logic is because this time he just chose not to kill this one. Ergo, he is good. Like. 
<laughs> it's exactly also, like it's also she, 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 she taught she she taught him the power of love because no, they say no, 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 no. he's got yeah. the whole world oh, in his school. hands. Yeah, and he does that as yeah. the plane's about to crash. Got the whole world. Yep. The whole well, that dude at the yep. back's going, Shut up, you sick freak, we're it. all gonna die. I love Which it. I shout on planes all the time. Um, <laughs> and every time we hit turbulence, you know. But anyway, so like, let's just shell Bashemi. Who, which one of this insane supporting cast do you want to talk about? John Malkovich is fucking great in this movie. Yes, Ma Malkovich, <laughs> like, he's such a weird actor for me because it's he like, has I crazy know he eyes. Act. He was born for this, he was born yes, for this. I, I know he can act. Um, and it's like, actually, out of all of the, like, weird, fucked up sort of crazy performances he's done, this is one that, like, I really think oh, it's he, he he understood the assignment. He, he, you know what I mean? Uh, and he didn't he didn't try to, like, elevate the material or anything <laughs> like that. But he's just such a weird cat, particularly, like, all the stuff he did in the 90s, where he did, like, so many, like, just weird fucking movies. I mean, he did Rounders, he did Being John Malkovich. I love Mulholland being John Malkovich. Falls. <laughs> yeah, right? He, he did like so many mad like 90s films. Shit, man. His outrageous performance as Lenny in Of Mice and Men oh, is in oh, the 90s. You, you're also forgetting <laughs> his turn in The Man in the Iron Mask, which is low key one of the worst yeah, fucking movies I've you. ever seen. <laughs> but you love it anyway, right? Fun no, I don't. I don't love that movie. That's <laughs> yeah, fun. <laughs> so so Ma Mal Malkovich is like great in this film and like by the way like it has so many good like like a lot of the one-liners are like really bad uh but all of Malkovich's stuff is straight I'm, I've fire. finished this yesterday Richard because obviously any really good quote has to be referenced right it's yeah. the one I told Monty about on somebody insight it's when he goes Sai Anara please Sai Anara <laughs> Like, right. that's, that's how you have to know they know this yeah. is a bad film. Like they know they're not making fucking Citizen Kane boys. Like Sai and I, that's like some shit I would crowbar on an E League desk and myself feel embarrassed about. They put that in the movie and we're like, cut. Yeah, I've got the scene. Brilliant, excellent. Like that's just garbage. That's not. That's not even a. That's not even a pun. It's just you just incorrectly spell it Sai and Ara like, yeah, and I, just say goodbye in Japanese. <laughs> but like honest, honestly, so the, the, the like every scene he's in. It's just great. He is menacing in a believable way. I don't understand why he's m more smart than a special weapons and tactics division of like of course. <laughs> the armed forces, but he is as well. That scene, by the way, where he's like mapped out what the final battle plan's going to look like, like a Roman general. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and they put all the pieces down. And he's just pointing yeah. them in the sand. Oh, no. Who would do that, right? And then when the, when the convict goes, right, so that's the car. That's the car. That's yeah. the, what's the, the that's a rock. This is the boneyard. This is the hangar. This is our plane. What's that? That's a rock. Okay. That's a great punchline. <laughs> Even though it's shit writing, that's a hilarious. <laughs> By the what way, is happening? Things, things, things we're talking about wrong. now are exactly what I'm saying, Monty. If you're not on board with that, then for real, exit yeah. Connor. It's not the yeah, fight yeah, yeah, for you. Yeah. But the thing is, <laughs> as soon as I saw any of this shit, mate, I was in it for the whole ride. I've got my ticket. I'm in it for the whole ride. I'm loving this whole movie. I love it. And of course, he gets to do the thing which they don't do in movies now, and it's a meme now. Like they did it with, like, it, you know, it's morbid time in fucking Morbius. They do it for real. In Con Air. They do a close up on John Malkovich's fucking head and he goes, Welcome to Con Air. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. I have the only gun on board. Welcome to Con Air. <laughs> You're all flying. Con Air. Like, no, what? I love it. no one does this. I love it. I, like, listen, uh, I, oh, man, right. This is why they call him Jerry Brickhammer. Fucking Jerry Bruckheimer movies. That is subtlety. That none of that. In fact, he deliberately he loves it when it's like this. And this is what I mean. It's like this movie. It had me in stitches, dude. Like face oh, off. Mental. I was like, I, I couldn't laugh at any of it. This movie is so so offensive for modern sensibilities as well. I literally wrote this down, Duncan. Right. I said. <laughs> 
there's a, there's a five minute period where it sounds like I'm in a Call of Duty lobby, and I don't know if you recall. There is just like some shock. There's like a five minute period of like Dave Chappelle racially abusing a Native American yes. <laughs> before he sets him on fire, and then when Ving Rams breaks out of prison, he screams Allah Akbar. <laughs> <laughs> What is happening? Like, this film, like, trust me, I, I think if when Zoomers watch this movie, they will be genuinely shocked because this is a white guy. This this has got white guy screenplay written all over it. <laughs> it does. Liberal, so liberal use of the N word. There is some edgelord <laughs> shit going on in this, my friends. It is unreal. I couldn't believe what my, like, because I haven't heard anything like this in 20 years. Oh. So and I'd forgotten it. I didn't even remember Dave Chappelle was in this movie. The original no, I did, Dave I was Chappelle. Gonna say the same replaced. thing, dude. I actually completely forgot that as well. When I, even though I have a very good memory normally for movies, that's the one yeah. detail I didn't remember at all. I remember being like, yeah. "Is he in this film? What the fuck?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not yeah. Even that much to be fair, but yeah, he is in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave, way, Dave Chappelle. I'm, I'm, on the angle of like how cheesy it is how you've got to love it, right? I'll actually link it here. I, I, look, if Monty's recording, he can't listen. But if Richard can, skip to the end. It's this scene here where the DE agent gets shot, right? First of all, yeah, that yeah, premise yeah. also goes in the box of like insanely manipulative plot writing that's not actually as good as it needs to be to get a character. Like the whole thing of adding this DEA agent in, it's like a double agent. It's like, are you sure you know what you're doing? Listen, bro, I know what I'm doing this. Then the second he gets on the plate, it's like Pepe sweat, like, <laughs> I know. you just do like this guy's. <laughs> Is fucking dead immediately and then even the way like the scene i'm linking to them now where he tries to like pull the gun but think about how stupid this premise is his gun is on another like mass criminal that if there's no honor among thieves they're not going to give a fuck like they're going to go all right we surrender then right and so the point i want to make is this that should be a really serious scene guys like even in face off they try to treat that like all oh, the you know the pathos of him dying the baseline that is played, that's why I linked you the clip, Richard, towards the end, go to like, you know, like 155 or something. <laughs> when this guy it. fucks up, he's about to get killed. No one, just Nicholas Cage just start to look down like, you done fucked up, homie. Yeah, no. But then they put this mad, like, Seinfeld bass, like, boom, 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 boom. And it's like, what, <laughs> what is this cheese? It's not the 80s anymore. Please. What is this? <laughs> That, the idea of that, like I say, this is why you're right, Richard. The idea that the producer, the director, you know, people seeing the rushes every day, the idea they were just going, nailed it. Like, that just <laughs> lets you know what sort of movie this is. Like, look, 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 this is good is, filmmaking. There is so I much. Was, but like, like I was saying, I was laughing so hard when this guy died because of that, like, baseline they play <laughs> like that. And the fact that the kids are sort of like, what are you doing, bro? Like, sweet so only life flying yeah, inside this plane. Like, it's yeah. so ludicrous, so, the idea but, that's but, like but, a laugh but, scene at all. But the whole DEA agent, this is the, the pro one of the main issues that I have with this movie, like I said, is that it, it, they try and pack so much irrelevant shit that is never referenced ever again. You know, the only purpose of the DEA agent being on that plane is to cause a plot, a plot device for Cole Meany's thoroughly unlikable DEA agent boss to chase them around and attack helicopters. You know what I mean? If, it goes way, nowhere. If the DEA just doesn't exist in this movie and John Cusack's just allowed to do what he does, the whole thing's solved about halfway through and he actually saves everyone. You know what I mean? Instead, it's like the so comedy guy you're talking about. By the way, there's another piece of classic Americana because in the modern yes. day, you're going to think, that doesn't seem like correct protocol, but the idea he is just like, we'll just shoot the whole plane down with everyone on it. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's just like, and the way that's built, by the way, is like, that's just the default. Because remember, this is some nighty shit. That, that that's the default way America would deal with the situation. Like, what are you talking yeah. about? The issue here is how the plane is brought down. Shoot it down. Like essentially, no. it's like that classic one from years back where Putin, you remember there was like a terrorist scenario in Russia where they took like a theater or something. I think it's actually what they based yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Basically, because because Putin's still on that nineties America shit, his his thing was like just kill them all. <laughs> like like they didn't even try to like go, yeah exactly just, like, just kill them all, just get rid of them. In a, like in that. a post like, what, what in, in a post nine eleven world, it was like suddenly you know, we went back to like you it's know wild, very very briefly for about you know probably like eight years of the cops being the good guys again, you know all of that stuff, and then up, yes. back to back to the status so, quo now. But yeah, but yeah, but I I, I love Colmini in this movie and think he serves an absolute amazing <laughs> oh, purpose in this film. All right, so, so, by the way, here's another example. 
example where there's no way they thought this was skillful script writing. At the end, when his actual car, which is super iconic, <laughs> is flying around behind the plane, he actually, as though you'd ever say this, like, he goes like, hey, I have a car like that. There's no <laughs> way you'd say that. There's no you fucking way you would ever say that. That's actually some like bad comedy skit line. Like, what is, that's like an SNL skit or something like that. Of course it's your car, you fucking mad cunt! <laughs> Isn't that your car, Malloy? Couldn't be. I left mine at the office. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, so stupid. It's so stupid. <laughs> what what one of the, the moments in this movie that really encapsulates like how I think this movie is just so terribly written is that there are there's a ton of just extraneous stuff that is never resolved or is just yeah. so incredibly extra that it doesn't have to be in the film. So, for example, you guys might not even remember this scene, but there's a scene where and this also demonstrates just how fast this film moves. There's a scene with John Cusack where they're in uh Malkovich's prison cell, right? Cyrus the virus prison cell. Oh, and they're right, getting yes. all of the thing. All, they're like looking at his plans. And I clock this. All of the following things happen in a minute and seven seconds. And many of these things are just never referenced again. In a minute and seven seconds, John Cusack is sitting on is sitting on the cot and he takes Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper where all of the apostles have their eyes poked out. He deduces the code that has been sent in a letter and figures out that they're going to the Carson City Airport. He then gets up, leaves the room, tells the other like uh, prison officers who are in there not to touch anything. The guy's like, Oh, you shouldn't touch that as one of the other officers opens this thing that says do not open. It then ex it's a homemade bomb that explodes, throwing the metal prison door down the hallway, nearly decapitating John Cusack's character. And he just walks off as if nothing has happened. Do they reference any of the other plans ever again? Do they reference the fact that this explosion just happened? Did the explosion <laughs> even need to occur within this scene? No, none of these things are true. And it, it moves so quickly that he, he uncovers their entire plot in a minute and seven seconds, and they just add an extraneous explosion. It's also like when they're in the end on the Vegas Strip and the plane is crashing. The propeller carves through the plane between two characters for literally no reason. It doesn't kill anybody. It's just there. This is this is the issue with this movie is it moves so fast and there's so much stupid shit happening at the same time. It's very hard to focus on the good aspects of it, which are the characters themselves, because it's just slammed full of just nonsense, basically. Yeah, I mean, but here's the listen. thing. Some of, even some of the nonsense, though, Monty, what I actually think works, this is why that original thing we referenced earlier has to be a theme of, like, the notion, like I said, that this is like a dream of a bygone America. Like, when I watched this movie, I almost had, like, a vaporwave feeling of, like, fuck, the, yeah, like, there's something really crazy nostalgic about just, like, the way the <laughs> film's presented. And, like I say, yeah. the, like, naive worldview of, like, this is... Because, like, one of the ones, like, for example, that I love at the beginning of the movie is where they actually tell the story as though it's, like, you know, when people read those old timey civil war letters Monty where it's like well my darling I'll be coming back to you after four years it's like that's how like the fucking intro is when he's talking to his wife like what is that dear hummingbird break out the fine china chill the lemonade tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree cause this boy's coming home to his ladies this is so hackneyed, it's insane. How is this like a mid-90s movie? Like, what? So, the, yeah, I think some of that stuff's hilarious, though, mate. It's actually just fucking... And what like I, Richard says, the amount of quotables. Like, first of all, there's the one where he's like... Like, the person says it, you know, what do you think of me? I want to say, ugly all day. That's like a real fucking quote from the movie. There's the one, as yeah. you say, there's not just the put the bunny back in the box. Like, <laughs> that's so deep in the movie, it's ridiculous. That's an actual quote. Another good one was like, don't treat women like that. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what's your back yeah. security prison is at all? <laughs> yeah, but so look, what, what you have to what you have to remember is as well about because we, we'll have a serious talk about about pacing is obviously <laughs> where this all comes from. And as I said, lovingly I call him Jerry Brickhammer, but obviously we're talking about Jerry Bruckheimer, legendary, you know, big action movie producer. Um, and like we talked about when we were talking about you know Tony Scott's movies, and indeed it was Jerry Bruckheimer that produced. Uh, the great Tony Scott uh, trilogy of um, uh, Top Gun, Beverly Hills Cop 2, and Days of Thunder. 
uh, right, that he has this obsession. If you look at the types of movie he he produces, you know, of that notion of you know, fuck, fuck the extraneous stuff. What do people want out of the film? And how can we get to that dopamine hit as quick and as fast as possible? And obviously, you know, Top Gun is a fantastic example of that. But even in the non-action movies Jerry Bruckheimer produces, you know, he produced Dangerous Minds, right? He produced Crimson Tide. He produced Armageddon. And what do you want from those movies? You know, what you want from those movies is in Crimson Tide. You want the fucking square off with um, it's Denzel and uh, Gene Hackman, right? And you you want that. You want the speeches over the intercoms and stuff. And they get that. Dangerous Minds. You want to get straight to the. I can't reach these kids. You want that, right? So you you get that. You get that as quick as fucking possible. And so when he when he started producing the, the action movies he's known for, like, again, as a producer, he has an unprecedented slate. I've already told you about Top Gun. He did Top Gun. He did The Rock. He did Con Air. He did Armageddon. We won't talk about Pearl Harbor. He did all the Bad Boys movies. Like, this, this guy just understands that, like, there is a type of popcorn film people will always want. People of all yes. intellectual capacities. Sometimes you just want the fucking hit of the good stuff. And Jerry Brickhammer fucking gives it to you every single fucking time. He works with the directors that understand that assignment. As I said, he's done a ton with Michael Bay, a ton with Simon West who did this film, a ton with Tony Scott. And it's no surprise, where did he start? Jerry Brookheimer started in advertising. He met Don Simpson came out of advertising and they make these movies where is it fast oh yeah of course it is just think about a commercial what do i have to give you i have to tell you the product why you need it why it's good and here's a real life application for it in a in a nice friendly way and i gotta do it in 30 seconds this is the this is essentially what you're getting with connor and it's like I say, you might not if you like films like solaris <laughs> You're in for a bad. You're in for a bad time. But if you could, if, if you can appreciate what this movie is doing, you're in for a fucking great time. And I, I, and, and so, mad, mad, mad props to Jerry Brickhammer. Uh, big fan. <laughs> It, it's even the editing is like a commercial, like you're saying. I remember yeah. at the very start of the film when it's just Cole Meany driving that car into the parking lot. It, it, the cuts are crazy. I see like four different angles of the car in 10 seconds, for right? Ex, for an extraneous scene, that means exactly. nothing. It's for, it's it's for a scene where he's parking a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking great. You know, and, and, and by the way, I mean, like, as because uh, obviously, as Duncan said, you're dealing with a first time director here. You know, you know, Bruckheimer's fingerprints are all over this in terms of what he wants, what he thinks works. And as I said, I mean, like, you know, this this film, it's fucking edgy <laughs> and it's high octane. But but it's like in terms of what you would want out of a 90s action movie. You know, that was why for me it's just so it's tonally correct within itself yes. compared to face off. I don't <laughs> want this shit with the face and the fucking case closed yes. and the no face off took itself too seriously. Yeah, yeah exactly. 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 You you like I I want to be in on the joke and I want you yes. to be in on the joke and I want us to laugh together, have 90 minutes of fun. And fuck off. And as I said, Dude, by the way, I say, the accent is actually the key. You have to like that yeah. because essentially, like Nicolas Cage's acting in this movie for real looks like someone for the first time is attempting to emote. Like it's just <laughs> literally like the amount of scenes that are just like comedy gifts are insane, isn't it? Like, yeah, he's so uh, he's oh. so over the top in this film. It's ridiculous. Right. It's it's ridiculous. Hey Larkin, who's that guy? That is Cameron Poe, a parolee hitching a ride home. He's a nobody. It's, it's mental, isn't it? <laughs> Just by the way, like the um, that's why I say it. I had, just had a smile on my face the whole time because every time they're trying to do a serious scene like that, it's just still comedy. It's still just fun. By the way, the other thing as well about the movie, like Richard said about Face Off, is it just has an inherent whimsy in this film that you just you tune into and it's just there the whole time. Like it never really yeah. ever gets dark. Even the actual plot sets, which should get dark and tense of like, Oh my God. And his daughter's going to be there. They're all murderers. No, you're just loving it the whole time. It's just a fun ride. This movie, isn't it? 
I, I think I think as well though, like just to, to to sort of give it some props beyond, you know, like it, it just being fun. I will say, you know, in an era where, you know, it's particularly in the nineties, everybody was wanting to kind of top the stunts this movie at one point i almost want to think like somebody said hey should we make this a 3d movie because there's loads of scenes that just have shit coming directly at the camera right like plane wings that door from that scene with the bomb monty talked about it feels really weird it's always john cusack nearly dying like john cusack has about eight near misses in in, in this film but like but what i will say is the fucking stunts i mean shit that plane crash on the vegas strip is so audacious and oh, it's, it's so extra it's right at the end of the film you don't need any of that you've already no, had your no. fun you don't need any of this what you're gonna put give me a plane crash dead. on the vegas really, strip yeah my note was just you could have just ended this movie like 20 minutes early yeah. and then they just get silly at the end and just go <laughs> fuck it just go all out in it well, I know. Like, like I said, and, and so, they actually destroyed what? the front of the real sands yeah. casino because they realized yeah. they had a timing window to like destroy something iconic on the on the Vegas Strip, and they just did it, which is amazing. And by, and, and by the way, right? So just think about this for the end of a movie, right? And keep in mind the movie's already over, right? We know they're not going to get away. They're not going to uh, Fantasy Island, Cyrus the Virus. They're all going to get caught. It's just a matter of time. The plane's going down. The pilot's called fucking Swamp Thing. <laughs> He's, that's his prison name. <laughs> He's Swamp. <laughs> and they're just crash they're just crashing into Vegas, right? By by the way, as well, you'll never see that that road. It's like called Sahara Avenue or whatever the fuck. Like you'll never you'll never see that road in the strip having lived in because you'll never see it that free of cars, but whatever. Right. Anyway, they, they they crash onto the onto the strip, they smash the sign off the hard rock, they do the sands like you say, they grind it out. Da, da, da. Okay, this is the end of the movie now, right? Should, this is the end of the movie. This is outrageous. You've just done a plane crash into an actual casino in Vegas. Like, br bravo. Like, you've got, like, literally, you had, you had me at plane crash. Like, <laughs> you, you don't need to do any more. Like, a fucking motorcycle chase. So, a double motorcycle chase chasing a fire truck with John Malkovich <laughs> on it. the back, spraying yeah. down police officers yeah. with a water cannon. What is this? And then... You kill Malkovich three times. <laughs> you chain him to a ladder that smashes into yep. a bridge. He goes yep. through a window. He goes through power lines, electrocutes himself, and then somehow lands on a... What even is it? A it's head a squishing machine. Yeah, just a head <laughs> squishing machine in the middle of Vegas. Or anyone want to say, do you want to crush a man's skull? Step right up, sir. His head lands perfectly on it. Into the perfect head switch. It kills bro, him like guillotine is bro, hilarious. I know, it's hilarious. Bro, bro, like, like that is stand innovation levels of magnitude. I love, it. I, love like, it, I know, I know. Fucking thank you. This is so stupid. Thank you for, yes, like, exactly. unfucking my brain for 90 minutes. This is great. So, like, I'll, I'll tell you, in terms of, like, the stunts and the audaciousness, this is ridiculous. This is, yes. th this at the time in 97 would have been Bar raising stuff like not not ironically this sure. the last twenty minutes of this movie are unbelievable stunt work and just unbelievable spectacle. I also, can't agree I with you there. Think, <laughs> I actually do think as well that like this movie needs to stay at this whimsical, silly nineties Americana mm -hmm. tone because like like I say, I actually low key think that that premise to keep the tension like he's never met his daughter, so if Malkovich kills him before then he's fucked like that actually that part doesn't even work because as I say, the scene when he meets his daughter is one of the least satisfying payoffs probably ever oh, yeah. in the history oh. of a movie. Like all you need is to have not said the stuff about him not meeting her. It's an obvious that you know you all go, Oh my god, I'm so glad to be with you. But instead you make this whole thing where it's sort of like Go on, hug your dad. It's like, ah, oh, it's a bit weird. No, it's like, what is no, what it's all this for? What's this? Yeah. Yeah, while while John Cusack sort of looks over and goes. And then just sort of a just sort of a weird like cut to Bashemi. Like, <laughs> like, 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 great casting as well from John Cusack. 
John yeah, Cusack yeah. is Cusack's just a great. very amiable uh, actor, yeah. isn't he? So he, he's perfectly cast. My problem with that is this, though. I always think this about this type of actor. It's the reason why in movies I actually have a, a theory I've mentioned before that I actually think a lot of movies like are to psyop you into how you think about real life people who do that job. So, for example, I do think one of the psyop elements of cop movies is they actually set the expectation that real dangerous criminals will never be caught because it's always some lone genius, brilliant cop mm. who goes against the system who catches them. It's the same thing here. Like the actual message of this movie is mental. It's like, wait a minute. So the DE agents, a complete clown idiot, would never have solved anything, would let them all get away. But this one guy who, by the way, his job doesn't even make sense. He's going to these lengths. He's like the one hero who's battling the whole institutional system to actually get them to finally like save the day. And basically, if John Cusack isn't in this film, like... They just get away with it all. Like the, the bad guys would have just won. Like the whole system would have fucked up and just lost them in that desert. And then, by the way, Steve Buscemi. Well, the joke is Steve Buscemi's out there ripping fucking heads off anyway at the end, isn't he? But like, happy ending. See, good night, kids. See you. Sleep well. Oh, like, what, what's so weird about the end of this movie is because they set up everything so stereotypically with. Cameron Poe, Nicolas Cage's yes. character, being the all American RB Ranger. Get, I'm, 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 and get then, past the name as well. Cameron Poe. It's like, <laughs> what, what even is this? So, so what, what's so outrageous is that <laughs> it has to have a happy ending, right? Yes. Because that's what they've set up. It has to be cheesy, it has to be stereotypical. And instead, the whole narrative with the buddy, which is like filthy by this point in time, his daughter doesn't want it. She's scared of him. And then it just cuts to Steve He's Buscemi on. Blood. On the lamp, he's covered in blood, and then it's just Steve Buscemi on the lamp, and it's like Nicholas Cage is like, I, I thought about cutting my hair as his daughter hides from him. It is the weirdest, least satisfying ending, and it's not like a twist or anything interesting. It didn't make me learn something about their characters. It was just bizarre and a complete non sequitur to everything we had seen or expected from this film previously. Like, what the fuck was yeah, that decision? That's fair. No, that, that that's fair. And look, I'll, I'll just say this: it's like, obviously, you 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 do a movie where it's like, uh, so we we let's end it with a fucking plane crash on the Vegas Strip. Yeah, we all good with that. And then somebody goes, but what if Cyrus was to escape in a fire truck and the only available vehicles <laughs> and like, to chase him on? were, well, yeah, yeah, you can come up. <laughs> hey, listening. that guy, can you yeah. can you build yeah. a head what crushing you machine? Machine? Listen, <laughs> hear him up, hear him up, guys. Hear him up. I know. <laughs> Uh, has anyone ever seen that head crushing machine that's on the strip? Well, I haven't, but uh, music to my ears, you know. So, so like, I think the problem is like because the film is so big and bombastic, even though it's bookended with that god awful like, "How can I live I without you?" <laughs> like, really? really? Like, what about the use of "Sweet Home Alabama"? And then when Bashami turns around and goes, "You want to know the definition of irony?" People dancing on a plane to a song written by people who died in a plane crash. Definitely not the definition of irony there, but you know what? I know. Uh, you, I know. It is making me like you, you mass murderer. Yes. <laughs> we, we do live in a society, sir. But no, anyway, I think the point is they just got to the end of the movie and they just went, ah, fuck it. Like, if, you, if you're not happy by the end of this film, fuck you. Like, so they just like, and, and Nick Cage meets her and it's going to be difficult, but that, but Kuzak's there to tell you, isn't he? Kuzak's like with that little whimsical nod. He's there to tell you they're going to be okay. They're going to make it. It's going to be all right. That's what Kuzak's telling you. He's the real heart of the movie, right? <laughs> and he's best buddies with Cole Meany now, and they, they started out fractious. It's going to be okay. That, that in itself is stupid as fuck. The idea the DE agent forgives him destroying his whole car and everything, and just being perma prick to him 24 that seven. Anyway. And, then, yeah. and then at the end, he's just sort of like, oh, well, yeah. All's well that ends well. Like, what are you talking about, you bad cunt? <laughs> also, by the way, I actually do low key love how shit Nicolas Cage is acting in this movie when he emotes it. Like, that scene. Really uh, remember, you're right, Monty, there are a million things happening in this movie. Another shit premise that they have to do to keep tension is that, as though, like, of all the things that could go wrong, right? Oh, I'm bloody diabetic. I tell you what, I'll take my shot on the plane. Like, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> Even this, you're like, I see where this but is going. I forgot and then about he, the diabetes like, thing. Yeah, you got, that's what yeah. I mean. You You've even forgotten that, even though that's like the central guy he's trying to keep alive at the beginning, if you remember, and save him, right? And then he has that yeah. scene where that guy goes like, I don't even believe in God. And then he goes, why are you doing this? And he goes, to show you that God exists. Hey, where are you going? I'm going to show you God does exist. It's like, <laughs> 
Nicolas Cage is so fucking whack, but in a fun way. It, like, I do enjoy it. Like, he is completely terrible. There, there's, so there's, there's, there's an so entire... The, the, I forgot it's the so main... Crazy. If I have a line in a script, Monty, if I'm for real, this is a Hollywood script, right, right, to show you God exists, that should be delivered like that's like the similar line from like Blade Runner 2049, like a really serious, like poignant thing that like he's going to play. No, even the way he delivers it is like, this is like a fucking, this is like I'm not even watching a movie. I'm on like the Universal Ride of Con Air at Universal Studios or something like, what is this? Is this like real cinema? So what is this? By the way, one of the central pieces of 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 conflict that drives the action forward is simply Nicolas Cage trying to get insulin to this guy yeah, because he yeah. during the during the entire fight sequence where they're fighting all of the national guard at the abandoned airfield he is literally just trying to rush a needle into the plane to give his friend insulin which is the stupidest motivation <laughs> and also I mean, just like, completely unnecessary bro, bro he's literally so like there's just an entire like 20 minutes, 25 minutes of the movie almost, where he is looking for a syringe. Yes, to give his that's what I'm saying. Friend. Yeah, but like, but like in it, what, what happens in that segment, right? He gets into a gunfight with three South American drug dealers who we didn't even know were there in a, in a jet that's just hidden in one of the hangars. He meets, he meets John, John Cusack. Cusack. He meets John Cusack, they have a weird little standoff, and he delivers that line, which I know Duncan will fucking love, the line where he goes, uh, uh, Sir, I, on I only trust two men. One's myself, and the other's not you. <laughs> and, uh, Can I lower this? Go ahead. You're going to lower yours? Sorry, boss, but there's only two men I trust. One of them's me, the other's not you. Yeah, right. And at the so end, he goes, I can now. Yeah. 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 And then at the end, there's a callback. That's when he goes, yeah. I can now say I trust three men. And John Cusack goes, Am I one of them? Who do you think he's talking about? You that. That's what you I love. The small one. Think, think how cynically this script is written that they were like, in the writing room, like, well, who's he referring to? It's like, oh, just reference explicitly that he does mean him. It's like, what? Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you wouldn't even reference him. Oh, yeah, it wasn't the him. first bit. But, but anyway, then, then he gets into that gunfight with the fucking South American drug dealers. Meets John Cusack, says, oh, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to go save the day. Runs off. Then the police are turning up and then he has a thing where he does some like special ops to tie, tie the plane up while no one's looking in that then he meets like an old dude who's hid under a truck the entire time as a like little bit of witty banter like, oh, it's better, like, it? you know, but like and then he goes to me he even says to him he goes, example, by the way. yeah go on I was gonna say he goes to him because you wouldn't have while they're under a truck hiding an old man he didn't even know was there. He just turns to him and goes, You wouldn't happen to know where I can find a syringe, would you? And the old man goes, Oh, don't do that, son. Drugs will be the end of you. No, by it's the way, that's an example, uh, that's an example of how like, unsophisticated much. the script is, though. Because as you say, right, the premise of that goes like this. This old man has hidden under a truck or car because it's like a shootout going with mega violent criminals. So one of them comes under the car and he just knows yeah. in his brain, he must just be the good guy then. Sound cool. He's the good oh, no one. Problem. Like, what the fuck? Just assumed and accepted immediately. Like, what we know. He just not, in. Thanks for no, your like, service. Okay. How, I'm on how the good you know I was in the uh, army? Like, I know it's just mental. It's so mental. Because essentially, like, the joke is, it's like he's supposed to know what we know in the movie or something. Like, yeah. It's just it's a guy unreal. in the truck. It's it's so unreal, and all of it's great. As I said, like I, <laughs> yes, I, I agree. Like, that, that's the thing. I, like it sounds like we're banging on the movie because you're gonna go. Oh, well, you hated all of these trying. things. In yeah. nah, we're not it. letting you. No, I was you're, 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 you're outvoted on this one. Yeah. No, but I mean, like, so, seriously though, I mean, like, were, were there any things that you sort of enjoyed? Oh, no, no. Look, I think the acting, the performances are great. And I did have a very fun time watching this movie. I just disagree that it's a better film than Face Off. Like, I would recommend this movie because it is stupid fun like Face Off. But the thing about Face Off is it actually stays with its premise and it kind of is laser focused with very few plot holes on that premise the entire way through. Like, the, the actual actions of the characters are much more interesting and make sense. The writing in this film is so fucking shit that the scenes don't 
even hold together. You forget that like 25 minutes of this movie is just looking for a syringe and accidentally bumping into each other for a character who is suffering from diabetic shock off screen that we have no affiliation with besides the fact that Nicolas Cage's character likes him because they spent time in prison together for a bunch of scenes that we didn't see because it was a montage of their time in prison and so we don't have emotional resonance with the character that he is supposed to care about. It's just fucking badly done. But it is entertaining in the moment. What is gloriously entertaining about this movie is seeing all of the actors play these ridiculous criminals and the way they interact with each other. But nothing else about this movie is good. It is shit. It is shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, look. It's here's here's one thing I think people will like, and I and I and I and I even if they understand this movie, and it might be what's worked on my brain because I haven't watched this in a long time. Um, I haven't, you know, all of these movies were movies I hadn't really seen in in, in a while. And uh, here's one thing I will say, I I think as a sort of antidote to the just everything now has to be steeped in fucking seriousness yep. sure. uh I, I i definitely think this this is a movie where you won't be able to admit it publicly guys because there's some fucking really heinous stuff in here that i am amazed it just hasn't been airbrushed out the film frankly i'm amazed it hasn't <laughs> yeah. been just like, like they do like oh we'll get it we're just gonna change that now like you know or they or what they do uh on the BBC over here in the UK, now if you watch a comedy that's like more than 10 years old, there's like a warning at the top saying, this was made in a different... 10 years old! This was made in a different time where our values were totally different and it may offend some listeners and it's like 10 years old, homie. Like, what the fuck? Did it really all change that much? And the answer is yes. But what I will also add is, if you are one of those people who, like, secretly, you are just, like, sort of a bit tired of it all. You don't have to be, like, that ridiculous, you know, one of them ridiculous people in the Chudders who good this pronouns in my movie you don't have to be that guy but you could but you can just be sick of a lecture being shoehorned into all the media you consume whether it's an explicit or fucking implicit one and you can watch a movie like this and i think you'll just be like oh you're okay all right it's okay it's okay it is it, it, it is like it's a it's like watching a movie like this now with the sensibilities of the time, it's like being a kid again and sneaking downstairs while your parents yes. are asleep and watching a horror movie at midnight because it's all the taboo, verboten <laughs> stuff, but it's just presented in a fun, non-harmful for the Zoomers, non-harmful, <laughs> that's the phrase. It's all just there to just be enjoyed and not taken seriously, and it's just like a meal. It's in and you shit it out and you don't think about it again. And um, but it's delicious while you're fucking eating it, and that's that's Con Air, man. Like this is a, this is a fucking wonderful testament to '90s excess with all of these. Think about all of these actors and what they went on to do. You know, think about like you know fucking like Steve Buscemi's incredible career, which was really just sort of getting started. You know, in '94 yeah, yeah. he's he's playing a fucking waiter in Pulp Fiction. You dig? You know, so. He, he, like Steve Buscemi's incredible career, which showed his range. John Malkovich, just like the master of ham, like so good. Uh, obviously, Danny Trejo, you know, like listen, low key. Danny Trejo has been in some iconic films, not least of all Heat, where it was only a, you know, small role, but he made it his own and has a very memorable scene within that. And so this movie, it's kind of like, it's almost. And I say almost, it's almost where the 90s excess ended and, and we sort of said, all right, cool, you, you, you've done it. That, that's as silly as it can sort of get. This is sort of like the yardstick. Uh, I think a few movies might have just snuck over the line or just under it, but this is the one. This is the one where it's like, this is the quintessentially silly, over-the-top, big cast, big action, big spectacle movie of the 90s. Where do you go from here? Actually, I'll tell you where we go from here. We 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 go, well, like when we were talking about noir, we go to LA Confidential after this. We've done the silly stuff. It's fine, you know. Like, and and it's what I mean. It, this is the this is the triumph of the art form. It, it, I, I agree. Like this it. this movie is kind of like the peak of all of the '90s action that we've talked about, encapsulated one package. And I admittedly did have a lot of fun watching this movie. 
I, I think that if yeah. you want to uh, be in an altered state of consciousness, like our friend Thorin here with a few of your friends, it's you're probably going to have helps. a real <laughs> you're probably going to have a really fun time watching this movie. And part of what's fun about this movie is shitting on it, to be clear. Like, I have had a yes. great time having this conversation because it's ridiculously fun to talk about why this movie is hilariously stupid. And that just that just comes with it. So I don't hate it, by the way, guys. I had a great time. I just I think it is. A worse film than Face Off. <laughs> yes, I agree with what Richard says, but I'll go on. No, I was just going to say, no, no, I think your point will make more sense, actually, Duncan, as a right. logical thing. Basically, so I'm just going to throw in a little thing at the end. Like, first of all, I do think Richard's framing is actually important to the discussion. Bearing in mind, this is 90s action. Like, if I asked someone, name the greatest action movies of all time, they'd get to this eventually, but it's probably going to be at the bottom of their top 10. Yeah. So I'm like, I actually think this is, like, top three. Like, I agree. If you look at what an action, especially an American action movie, if you look at what an American action movie is, I agree. Essentially, it's why I said earlier, like, that, like essentially, if you can't get on board with this, like, this just isn't for you, this genre, mate. Like, this is, this is right in the wheelhouse of everything you want. Essentially, to me, it's the ultimate guilty pleasure movie it's like when yes. i always tell people even though i am an elitist in all their areas i enjoy things i have my own guilty pleasures like i like limp biscuit i don't care that like you might think the lyrics are immature or fred does that yeah that's actually this played. is the that's limp biscuit of, of the movies jungle. by the way yes. <laughs> like here's my analogy because it's americana here's the analogy no one's pretending this is an amazing film in yon with all mediterranean style and like fucking like accoutrements the... no no this is like a fucking burger but it's like a fucking amazing burger that that's like grilled properly with all the onion rings on the side. And then it's got a fuck off ridiculous milkshake. And you're not going in thinking you're having some like incredible taste experience. You're going in for just a fucking burger and you're just trying to have like some classic, like you say, just fun, hearty, have some, have a, have a snack. You know, you're not afterwards going to think and talk for years about this fucking amazing meal you had. <laughs> no, no it's, it's very much like a, you get in, you get out. And so I also agree with that premise. Like I said about the whole idea of like revisiting a past age. The other thing that is a breath of fresh air is there's nothing Nothing postmodern about this movie, like you say, Richard. Like they're not attempting to actually make some sort oh. of like deep point about society or like th ask questions about like th it's the opposite. If anything, they're playing to the fucking the peanut gallery. They're just playing to the most obvious stereotypes, the obvious cliches. Nicolas Cage, even though I don't think he's doing it intentionally, is mega overacting everything. Is emoting <laughs> is absolutely ridiculous. It's like the sort of like sixth form fucking theatre cl club level shit of like <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. Like thinking he nailed these lines. So yeah. I I just think it's just a really fun viewing experience. And I, I actually do think I underrated this myself. This is another one where when I revisit, I enjoyed it like one and a half times more than I thought I would. And this is what's really interesting about it. So the the, the funny thing is, in usually when we look back and we talk about the reviews for these movies, one of the things that always happens is like, you know, we, we'll sort of generally be aligned with the public. Uh, you know, we'll rate something a six and it might be a six, five or a seven, you know, on Rotten Tomatoes. What's mad about this movie is uh, one of our recurring nemeses, Roger Ebert. Oh, <laughs> God, Lord, come this, on. This guy takes an age so badly. I know. No, get this though. He, he gave this a three out of four stars. Ooh, he liked okay. it and he said, it okay. moves along smoothly with a visual style and a verbal wit not seen in action movies. He fucking got it. He got well, it. Roger Ebert. Say, no, if you've been he watching the film, he loved Connor. Yes, you've nailed it. Remember, the first episode was about how Roger Ebert doesn't think the thing is good, but then he's like, "Con Air, though, right up my alley." Like, Roger, what are you talking about? Bro? Like, <laughs> and, and, and also, also the the New York <laughs> Times, the New York oh, Times oh, said on. it was an exemplar of the thrill ride genre, one of the best action movies in show. Okay. That's a New York Times review. What's interesting is over time, if you go to Rotten Tomatoes, only only it's it's got a five point seven with the audience. <laughs> I like, think that's fair. Oh, and by the way, no, I'll also say this. This, this is movie, a seven. This oh, is it's a easy. seven, it's, dog. It's, it's way too low. I'm actually amazed the scores yeah. are low. For me, yeah. it's easy to rate this high. And then secondly, I'll also say as well, this is like a classic example for me of why essentially like I can't quit you, Nicolas Cage. This is exactly why, because every now and then, <laughs> yeah. no matter whether he thinks he's doing a good job, he's just going to turn out a movie like this that you must watch, you'll never forget. Because there's yeah, the other totally. thing. I'll tell you one thing about Nicolas Cage that I'll, I'll give him very high marks for is whenever he does a role like this, I cannot even conceive of a different actor playing the same role. If you know what I mean? Like if I try yeah. to recast any movie, like his part, how do I do it? Because it'll never oh. be the same. There's, there's no one else simultaneously. Like the joke is, 
like I guess Arnold because he's not great at acting sort of has like a shit aspect to being an action hero but all the other ones have like a certain style like Bruce Willis and Stallone and stuff Nicolas Cage's style is so bizarrely unique especially because even in these stupid action roles he always does try to like think he's taking on like serious emotional tones and messages like and he's in this one he's so stupidly whack but in a way that I love like I actually it's a genuine guilty pleasure this film what what's super interesting as well is when this movie was put together like they didn't have anyone else in mind like apparently nick cage was the go-to yeah. guy but what's really funny about it is uh it wasn't going to be john malkovich the cyrus the virus come on who was it bruce willis turned this down no that would have been terrible i think malkovich is so much better in this yeah. part so so after bruce willis turned this down here were the other people oh, who they imagine for the lines. Like, imagine him like, well, it could be yeah. card. Man. Like, you know, like, know. like yeah. there's no way. There's no way. Cause, cause, you know, because obviously, like, he was, he, again, he's the quintessential dude. So, I mean, it would have been huge. They probably would have oh, made more money if Bruce yeah, yeah. Willis was in it. Absolutely. But, but anyway, so the other people that auditioned when, when Bruce Willis knocked them back was Mickey Rourke. I, I could fuck with that. I could fuck with 90s era Mickey Rock doing Cyrus the Virus. Uh, Willem Dafoe. That could also work. That could work. <laughs> that would have banged. That would have yeah. banged. That would have banged. And, Similar uh, rest... to Malkovich, actually, Dafoe. Yeah, exactly. Good totally, job. totally, yeah. totally. And uh, rest in peace, Tom Sizemore uh, went, went, went for it. Which, uh, minute, that, would be, that would be too much. Weight. You can't have Danny Trejo, Wayne Gore, and Tom Sizemore. Like, you're just doing <laughs> it. You're getting me Just a deep reunion, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. It's not the idea of Will Richards. There's no one else will know that reference. That on this movie, at some point, Danny Trejo, who never played Wayne Gore, essentially met up again, like, oh, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, Oh, heat was good, wasn't it? Like, what are you? What, are you, what are the chances you'd ever be in a movie again? To you two, I know. Yeah, not least so, because if you so, don't, Wayne Gore was the one who fucked over the Danny Trejo character quite brutally. Hence why I always make time for Wayne Gore in real life. <laughs> always, <laughs> you've always got to make time for Wayne Gore. But but you know, like so, and then obviously Malkovich, um, you know, got through the auditions. But uh, uh, you know, uh, as I said, I think it's super interesting as a period piece uh which you know in the 90s is a long time ago now uh just just by virtue of being an action movie where the action star is almost superfluous i i would say malkovich probably steals the show but everyone e everyone has a memorable scene a memorable line Everybody's natural charisma gets to shine through, and meanwhile, oh, you've, you've just reminded me of something more. That yeah. actually the worst scripted part because the concept of this is utterly implausible. Go is on. the part where essentially Nicolas Cage halfway through the movie could have just walked away and had a safe yeah. life, but he yeah, chooses like you're saying to go back into the plane scenario, even though like you just wouldn't like. And his logic is like it almost works, but it doesn't. Which is that like you know I wouldn't want my daughter to grow up in a world where like you know this happens or something which is like that doesn't make any sense though like no, no he thinks his friend's gonna die the... that's why he goes back that on it, whatever then but but the motivation is so stupid though that's still a criminal he, like, he, remember, does, he does his say what Duncan said as well, as well. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. also says what I said but his friend also isn't innocent by the way well, that's another part about this movie the movie becomes anyone who just sort of tries to help Nicholas Cage is therefore good and redeemed immediately yep. even including literal murderers and serial killers because <laughs> that's the crazy I still can't get over think about this because as you say Monty's right in a way, what makes you not notice how stupid it is is that it is so fast, like the pace is so yes. crazy. So you don't notice that they're stacking all this stuff. Like, think about this. Think about how they introduce the fucking Steve Buscemi character. Like you say, fully lectured out. And then at the end, it's just like the happy ending is he's just loose in the world. Like, <laughs> No, but what like, funnily enough, but it's all killer because he didn't that kill that one girl. Lecter as well, though. He, he that's didn't kill that one. It is, it is true, but he didn't kill that yeah. one girl, so it's all good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you all, we, we were all there watching Silence of the Lambs at the end when yeah, he went, I'm true. having an old friend yeah. over for dinner, or whatever. I'm having an old friend for dinner. <laughs> yeah. And we went, Yes, he's going to eat somebody again, the cannibal. <laughs> like, what the fuck has happened here? My twisted morality, charisma. I it's a powerful it. and seductive drug. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so just to put a pin in it. Um, I, I uh, this movie's great. Uh, it's not great because of Nick Cage. Face Off yes. was nearly great because of Nick Cage. This is the inverse. Nick Cage <laughs> is stinking up the joint, but the joint is so wonderful it doesn't even matter because you know for every Nicolas Cage line in a bad Alabama accent. 
There's Cole Meany just popping off. There's fucking <laughs> John Cusack. Cool as fuck, 90s John Cusack looking straight to the camera all the fucking time. Yes. It's Bing Rams playing a fucking yes. <laughs> a terrorist, a black nationalist called Diamond Dog. It's fucking, <laughs> it, it, it's John Malkovich chewing the fucking scenery. Every, like uh, Dave, this movie, Dave Chappelle. You... Dave Chappelle's uh, uh, entire shtick is ridiculous. He's doing a oh, stand-up yes. show on a fucking plane. Yes. <laughs> Mate, there's a scene Chappelle. I didn't reference earlier, that ridiculous one where the DE agent takes it with a gun to his head and goes, I'm a DE agent. You know what that means? And then Dave Chappelle, the character with the gun to his head, goes like, yeah. it means you're the most crooked N-word on this plane, <laughs> which is like, that is banter, but the idea you're saying that one, he's got the gun. It, I know that's just, you're just roasting him like he's a heckler. Yeah. And by the way, here's, here's what I would say is my final lot about this movie if you don't like this movie you just hate america love it or leave it this <laughs> yeah. movie is fucking <laughs> it is peak america it's the simpsons it it's it. creed it's fucking limp biscuit it's fucking the nfl joe montana jerry rice the dallas cowboys america's team apple pie like, give me a fucking break like this just is the ultimate americana movie in many ways monty when the american empire completely collapses and is a, is a relic of history this will be the high water mark at which they I jumped the shock of civilization. Like, this is this, the best you had to offer as a civilization. This, this, this will be the epitaph on America's yes, tombstone. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. Uh, can't say we don't deserve it. <laughs> I Look, I, I had a blast watching this movie as ridiculous as I think it is. And I hope you guys, as you go, have you, as you followed us, like clearly Total Recall is the very best movie of these that oh, we watched. Easily. But yes. all of these films that that we picked mission impossible face off total recall con air are all so memorable like if you watch yes. along with us you are never in your entire life going to forget these films for for better or for worse it's and i'm most entertaining genre we did so far easily yeah and every and movie's I, worth watching every movie's worth watching and i bet that a lot of you will watch these multiple times throughout your life because you keep they're so ridiculous a lot of the time or they're so iconic that you're going to just keep coming back to them for laughs with friends it's and I, right now aside from if you want the smoking session the other obvious time to put this movie on is if you ever like pre-drinking for an hour before you go to the bar with your boys or something this is a movie where there's so many quotables again by the way the other thing about it is you wouldn't even need to follow the story you could turn this on halfway through and enjoy it you know what i mean it's not <laughs> it's not really that serious in that regard you just enjoy the fucking ride like i say also was not nominated for two Oscars. That's insane in itself. Which Oscars was it though? It better not be actors. It's like sound editing, isn't it? Nominated. Come on. Who's the customer? That's sound editing. That's sound editing. There you go. And uh, and it it was also nominated for best original uh, song, which was the How Do I Live. They got they got nominated for really okay. Molly Molly. So there you go. Was that the first movie that song was in or something? I, yeah. I, I think I think it might yes. actually been written for the film. Because yeah. that's, if so, Diane that's a perfect example of what this movie is. Because now everyone knows that movie. It's perfect cheese, isn't it? But if this actually was the genesis of it in movies, that it, it nailed it. That's what this movie is, isn't it? <laughs> so, so anyone who hates on this film, not only do you hate America, right? Not only do you hate America, not only do you hate American civilization, you also hate the, you hate Oscar quality work. In fact, you know the joke is, Richard. My joke would be: this is the movie. Look, straight fire jokes. So get ready to edit it out. This would be the movie that Bin Laden watched and was like, "I do hate America and their freedoms." Because he watched this movie, he's, he's so like, "I can't hate it." They're so no, goddamn I'm, free. I don't have this exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm... Say, you know, as far as freedoms, that's what I'm thinking. Dude, Bin Laden's on TikTok now. It's fine, actually. You, you can leave that in. <laughs> yeah, true. He's on true. TikTok. Now. Well, with that, guys, uh, that'll wrap up our '90s action arc. We will see you for the start of our Christmas arc next week with Batman Returns. See you then. 